Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I am so excited because this is going to be a fun show along with a very informative show because there's going to be some details in the information that I'm getting ready to share with you via my guest. My guest is DK Carter. He is married and has been married for 40 years, over 40 years, and they have four children, three grandchildren. It's super exciting, especially if you're a grandparent, you know how exciting that can be. He's from Abilene, Texas. He played basketball at Abilene Christian University, where he earned his BA and MA in, in the Bible and New Testament. He also served as a youth minister for six years and then discovered his calling in the insurance and financial services industry. What's really neat, and if you know biblical truth, you can know how well and how much value is in this. And we'll go into that in a little bit as well. He is now president of Carter Financial Group. Uh, after having 45 years of experience, both in insurance and financial services, he's an investment advisor uh, representative with Sound Income Strategies, which is based out of Fort Lauder Lauderdale, Florida. And he's worked in the major insurance company industry for 25 years prior to founding Carter Financial Group. Say that three times and you're good. So he's also a chartered financial consultant and many of you may be familiar with that term and there may be many of you who are not. And we'll find out a little bit more about that as well. But he's also recognized as a registered financial consultant. This is important because there's a lot of people who claim they're financial consultants or they want to share with you all this information about your money and they really don't know what they're talking about or they don't have the certification or even the recognized certification behind it. And he's certified um, as an RFC through the International Association of Registered Financial Consultants. He's also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors in Texas. And he's nationally recognized as an Elvis tribute artist. Would you believe it? Yes, what a profile. I love it because there's so much that makes him so well-rounded. He's also a radio show host who has a weekly radio program. I'm going to let him share a lot of that information with you. And most recently, he's an author of It's Now or Never. And I love it. I can't do it. That's why I talk and sit and sing, but, and it's how to enjoy your life and not let your investments own you. I'm interested in that because I can't tell you, oftentimes we work for our money instead of letting our money work for us, and this is really, really important. And so there's a lot of information here that Dee's going to share with us today, but let's get started, Dee. How did, aside from what I said, how did all this culminate for you? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I appreciate you asking, Rebecca. I've spent so many years trying to hone what I do that everything that I've done going all the way back to my, uh, well, actually to my childhood, if you read the book, you'll find that, uh, is part of who I am. And uh, I find that to be the case with nearly everybody that comes into my office. They all have a story to tell. Uh, they may not be quite as involved as mine, but they all have a story to tell. Uh, and it, everything that I've done has brought me to where I am today. From the fact that uh, I, I was in the ministry, as you, as you mentioned, I spent six years uh, uh, in the ministry. I, I got my master's degree at Abilene Christian University, still very active with the university in Abilene. I live in Midland, Texas now, but I, but I was in Abilene for a long time. Uh, everything that happened there is a part of me. There's a, two or three chapters in the book that has a lot to do with Abilene and, and Texas in general. Being in Texas is not just a state of mind. It really helps you to develop who you are. And uh, I tried to live in your state in California for a couple of years. Didn't work out too well. I came back as soon as I could get back here. But the, the beauty of it is everything that I put in the book and everything that I've tried to accomplish over the years is part and parcel of who I am. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can look at the pictures behind me. You can see on the wall. I've got guitars hanging in here. I've got stories uh, about uh, hymns. I've even got a picture of Elvis back there on the wall that actually hung in Elvis's house uh, back in, in Graceland many, many years ago. So 
uh, everything's a part of it. It's really a part of who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing how God leads us and the ah. direction that we end up going sometimes isn't the one we originally thought or we were going to start out with or even finish because there's so much. And so starting out as a youth minister, here's what I find really just so important in that in financial services, you need to have someone who you can trust and dedicating your life. You already know that this, this is the foremost. So that being said, there's more though, because there's so much based. There's a lot of information reading, even if you're not Christian, you just looked at it as a historical textbook. There is so much information. That's a foundation of our finances and everything that we do. And so I just find that this is really just so perfect with what you're doing and where you came from and the length of time that you have been involved in financial services is just extraordinary. There's a lot of people who can't crunch numbers and they just can't even do their taxes, let alone spend the length of time that you have. But something I found very interesting is that, and I've got a lot of questions because your book is absolutely fascinating and it really gives you an opportunity to say, okay, I can do this or I can begin to do this instead of just being told what to do. You're talking about how you've gotten there and the directives that you have inside the book are just phenomenal. But you wrote it for two groups of people. I really, I really, I really did. I wrote it for the people, uh, actually for three groups, if you want to kind of develop one into another. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, the one group is the people that have never really done any financial planning. They're, they're, they were kind of afraid of it. They don't, they don't know anything about it. They don't know how to share or what questions to ask. And so I wrote it for that group and I said, hey, it's not rocket science. It really isn't. It's just sitting down and starting at the beginning and working your way to where you're trying to go. And that group of people, and there's a lot of those out there, as you know, Rebecca, they're everywhere you look. The second group I wrote it for are the people that have started but never completed their task. And there's a bunch of those, too, that got started, but maybe they got off on the wrong track. Maybe they found someone that uh, perhaps didn't listen to what they had to say. Perhaps they didn't really get the advice they thought they needed. Perhaps they were, didn't feel like they were being listened to. And that group is another group. The third group I wrote it for, and this may be as important as the other two, and that's the people that do what I do. Because, okay. Well, okay. I, yeah. I started out in 1974 when I got my securities license. Do you know they're still training people today the same way they trained me 47, 48 years ago, 47 years ago now. And that's wrong. That's just totally wrong. So really what I'm trying to say is, uh, number one, you can get the job done. You mentioned it great. Great point you made. Find someone you can trust. Find someone that will listen to you. Find someone that you can relate to. Find someone that the communication lines go back and forth and they're not just one direction. And then sit down with them and really let them pick your brains. But more than anything else, make sure you share everything that you need to share. So I did it for those people and uh, it's, it's worked extremely well for me over the years. I've got a great clientele mm -hmm. here in Midland. In fact, I've got clients even in your part of the state down in, in around Belton. I've got, in fact, I'll be down in your part of the state here in a couple of weeks visiting clients and I'm looking forward to that. But wonderful. everything that we did, everything that I've done has kind of led me to where we are today. All of the experiences, the, the music background, the, the ministry, I used to say that being a, a youth minister is kind of like herding cats. You really don't know which way they're going to go. So it, that helps you too, because you kind of get, you learn to communicate with a younger group and an older group their parents, mm -hmm. and that carries over into what I'm doing today. So it all works together, it seems. I, I think it's really interesting because you have seen a lot of changes oh, yeah. over the amount of time that you've invested. Uh, the, the <laughs> yeah, the changes are unbelievable the way we used to do business. I mean, when I first got started, we did everything by hand. You literally got all the facts down. You did what you needed to do and you did it by hand in your office. You had uh, two or three secretaries working on it, most of whom quit because they didn't want to do it after a while. Uh, but 
as we moved along to computers, I can remember my first computer was the size of a bus. Uh, and all it did was feed back stuff that I fed into it. And if I gave it bad stuff, it gave me bad stuff back. Now we've got things that are absolute. Well, here, great point. In fact, I'm sitting in front of my computer, 400 miles from you. And we're having a conversation meetings mm -hmm. today. I have clients that I meet with on zoom or Skype, depending on what they've got. That that's nothing that we could do. Not even 10, 15 years ago. So, uh, but a lot of the guys haven't that's gotten true. into that. They're not being trained that way. And I think, and I'm an old guy. I've been around for a long time, as you point out. Well, I'm not as old as I, I don't look as old as I really yeah. am. So that works out. But uh, the thing about it is you've got to learn to roll with the punches, to develop what you can and be part of what's going on around you. And that's what we've tried to do. And it's worked extremely well. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And I, I can see that, especially in the financial industry, Growing with technology and not being afraid of it, it, as frustrating as it can get, is something that really will help a lot of people. Now, here is, you know, the three groups of people that you talked about earlier. There's one group that I really kind of want to reach out to. And I really think that your book and the information that you share in it is going to be a game changer because a lot of people get to a place in their life and we can call it retirement age, but there's a lot of early retirement people yeah. out there. And so the thing of it is they're at this position now where they have may not have ever invested or they've only invested a little bit or during some of the different waves that we've had, they've lost their 401k or they've had to use it for emergencies and are at this point and they're saying, well, it's kind of too late for me to do any investing now because I'm on a fixed income. I'm, I don't even know what I'm going to do now. And there is opportunity and there is hope. But like you mentioned, you've got to be able to trust somebody and tell them everything that's going on so that they can help you. There's no embarrassment in this. It, 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 it's, it's as close to being a, uh a minister and a priest as you can possibly get in the financial realm. It really is. Uh, uh, in fact, I even tell my clients, whatever you share with me stays in this office. It's just like you came to your minister and talked to them about a, your a spiritual problem. We won't, but I need to know, I need to know where you are, what you're trying to do, where you want to go, how you want to spend your life when you get there in order for us to be able to find a way to make, to build a track for you to run on. Uh, exactly. If we don't have a track to run on, you're never going to know when you get there. So uh, even if you're older, I mean, we can actually make it work. And I tell people all the time, we've been investing uh, for the last, oh, Rebecca, for the last 100 years in growth items. And we watch the market go up and down. And we watch it crash. And we watch our 401ks go to nothing, basically, or to, to uh, seed, if you will. And right. there's ways that you can invest that you don't have to worry about that. And as you get older, you can still have a good return by investing in income as opposed to growth. And we do a lot of that. I have a lot of that in the book. Uh, in fact, I go to all of my clients and if I do it on, if I'm doing it on zoom or on Skype, one of the things I will do is I'll say, hold up a piece of paper, write on that piece of paper, uh, T R big T R equals G plus I. And that, that means total return equals growth plus income. And then I explain to them it. that income is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then I go from that point. Mm -hmm. Now in your book, I mentioned earlier about these directives and those who are watching may not have read your book just yet. We're hoping that they absolutely go out and grab a copy. So what are these directives for those who don't know? Well, the, the directives uh, at the end of it, you're talking about the directives at the end of each chapter, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those directives are part of and parcel of what I talk to nearly every client about. In fact, uh, it starts off very, very basic. Uh, get a budget for crying out loud. Get a budget. Don't live above your, but uh, within your means, live below your means. Uh, learn how to save. Put it on a systematic basis. They're all very, very fundamental. But at the same time, people don't do it. They just, they hear it, but they don't do it. So mm -hmm. I try to give them all the directives. I think there's like 18 directives there that uh, if people will read those directives, they could skip reading the book. The book is fun. And I hope people will read it because it's a fun thing to well, read. But at the I've same time, I want to one read of your directives. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
<laughs> well, one of your directives really caught my eye because we've been talking about this, it's kind of scuttlebutt, that has been going around for a long time in that, well, you know, social security isn't going to be there and so on and so forth. And so I read your directive, count on social security, but don't count on it. And so yep. this is something I think people need to pay attention to. You know, and I do social security seminars. I do free seminars with a group called the, the Scranton Academy for Financial Education or SAFE, which is a great acronym. But I do that uh, uh, four or five times a year. And what we do is we teach people how to use social security. And we talk about the fact that anybody that's retiring within the next uh, 15 years or so until about, about 2033, uh, it's going to be okay. The social security system is not going to go anywhere. You're going to be guaranteed what you've got. And it's going to be there for you. But unless the federal government does something about social security between now and 2033, there's going to be about a 25 to 28% drop in the benefits. Well, now you better not be counting on social security. You know, the average social security check is only about $1,300. Try living on that for a while. You're not going to make it very far. So what we try right. to say is, you can count on it somewhat, but don't count on it for everything. Uh, it's, right. like, it's like Volkswagens will definitely flow, but they won't float indefinitely. So we got the same thing with Social Security. It will not always be there like we know it today unless the federal government does something about it. So we try to train people how to use it, you know, how to use it at the, at the absolute zenith of its, uh, uh, the money making that it can do for you. I love it. What I'm hearing you say, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that relying on one stream of income, whether it be Social Security or anything else, is really not the way to go. You need to have some streams available to you because if you lose one, you've lost everything you've got. I totally agree. And you're exactly right. I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, we used to call retirement a three-legged stool. And we said it was a 401k or your IRAs, your Social Security. And your, but, you know, there's more to it than that. If you don't do something over and above what you're putting at, even at your business, and, and there's something in my book that one of the directors talks about, max out your 401ks, take whatever you're offered. If they're going to match it at 5%, put your 5% in there. But if you don't want to do that, you're, you're wasting your money. You're throwing it away. But mm -hmm. be careful where you put it inside the 401k. Find an advisor because there's not many guys that do the 401ks that will sit down and do individual reviews with the employees. So find someone that knows about 401ks. And by the way, I used to administer about 25 of those things here in, in West Texas until I got smart and said, I don't want to do that anymore. But it was it care, it's terrible work. But uh -huh. what I've learned to do is to sit down with people and say, here's where you are. Here's where you need to be. Here's where you can save yourself in case the market does one of these things like it's going to do again. It will do it again. And when it does, you don't want to be caught in that trap. Mm -hmm. So we try to help people to manage their 401ks and even their personal IRAs that may be uh, in a brokerage firm. We try to take a look at those things as well. All of that is part and parcel of what the book is all about. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I also like that you've given people an opportunity to think within themselves before they go to a financial expert. And in one of the chapters you have getting ready for a meeting yeah. and you're asking them to take 10 questions right. and ask those things of themselves right. to really think through what you're going to need to be prepared with when you go to the meeting. And even if you were to be a little apprehensive about going to the meeting. This is going to go where you need to be, what you need to do, the options that are available to you. And there are experts that are going to be able to really answer more questions that are going to sprout from these seeds that you've planted. Well, I just love it. Uh, well, that's a really good point. And I, I have found even in my practice, I've had people come into my office and after we've interviewed with them and talked with them for a while, I will actually tell them, okay, you haven't asked me three or four of the most important questions that you really should be asking me. And let me ask those questions and answer them for you. And I realized I was doing that over and over again. I thought, why not put that in, in the book and say, listen, 
there are several things you need to be talking to these guys about. And ladies, we've got a lot of great women out there. In fact, Midland's got some outstanding advisors, female advisors, but I'm trying to get them to ask the right questions. Uh, most people just go in and they put themselves at the beck and call of the advisor and whatever they do and whatever they say, that's what happens. That's not a good idea. You're still in charge. It's your money, mm -hmm. it's your life, it's your retirement. Ask the right questions. So I've got a list of questions. And by the way, Rebecca, I can answer the questions. If I hadn't, can't answer them, I wouldn't have put them in the book in the first place. But that's that's just an, as an aside. I, I love it. And there's two chapters which I don't want you to go into because I think just the title of them alone is enough to get people interested in just these two chapters, if nothing else, and it's being true to your values and wealth with a purpose. These are two essential things for people to think about, and if they haven't given any thought about that, how to be true to their own values, there's a lot in that statement, in that title, in itself, and the same thing, wealth with a purpose, because what are you gonna do with, with what you have? And wealth can mean one thing to one person, and something to somebody else. But let's talk a minute about the kind of wealth that you have had emotionally when you do your Elvis. Ah, uh, I knew you'd get around. Yes. That. Yeah, everybody always gets back to Elvis when I do it. You can tell by looking at me, I haven't done it for a while because I got a beard and a gray hair. But uh, I was doing <laughs> Elvis up until about four or five years ago, actually. Uh, of course, I wore a wig and the sideburns that were glue on, but. Uh, uh, I was doing Elvis up until about four or five years ago, and I still sing with the Middle Old Dust Symphony Chorale, and I love singing. I, I sing a lot, and it's part of my life. It's really part of my life. But the Elvis thing was uh, standing on stage in front of a group of, of two and three and four thousand people, and them treating you like you're the real guy, and you think, you know, you people need to get a life. This guy's been gone for a long time, but it's absolutely the most amazing experience you can possibly have. It's you uh, you become the guy, whether you think about it or not. And I, unfortunately, God blessed me with the kind of pipes that I can sing the notes without having to worry about the pitch. I can sing his notes, but it's uh, it's still the most amazing experience I've ever had from the standpoint of entertainment. Uh, people idolize the guy, rightfully or wrongfully. It depends on your view viewpoint of the man. But he changed the music industry, and there's a lot of people out there still. Yes. One of my best friends lives in your area, by the way, that does a really great Elvis impersonation. Uh, and, uh, he, and he and I used to work together. We'd share the stage. So it's um, it's something, it, it, it's part and parcel of who I am again. Uh, the music, the Elvis thing, you can you can see the guitar back there, the one that I carried on stage with me. It's got Elvis's name on it. Uh, it hangs there on the wall. It probably needs to be tuned right now, but it, it hangs there so people can look at it. And guess what? A lot of people come in here and they start talking about Elvis. And for some reason, and I think the reason is most people can relate to this, that is a tie. And we get a relationship going based on our maybe our love for the music, our love for what the guy did. Uh, maybe his lifestyle was something we were glad we don't live that way. But uh, it's amazing how that, that kind of bridges some of that area between you and the people you're talking to, because we're actually talking about the same guy. I've had literally had to stop people and say, we need to talk about you instead of Elvis, because he's been gone for about 40 years. So let's talk about something else right now. And, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting how that happens. Well, Dee, maybe you haven't oiled your pipes for a little while, but let's talk about the oil that is happening now, because I think that this is something that's going to be of interest to a lot of people because of all of the speculation about what's getting ready to happen with the economy. You know, having so, lived in West, yeah, I live in West Texas, so we live in the largest oil producing area, the third largest oil producing area, in fact, in the world, uh, and we're creeping up on number two, as a, as a matter of fact. Uh, West Texas area is uh, by far the largest producing oil area in the United States. Now, having said that, we, I've got a lot of clients that work in the industry, so I kind of hear what goes on. I will say this to your, to your watchers, to the TV people that are there watching, that most of the people that are in the oil business today have contracts that are going out two and three years in the future, which tells me that we're going to see the oil business stay stable, pretty much stable, 
for the next two to three years because they wouldn't be spending gargantuan amounts of money to do this drilling if they didn't think the mm -hmm. oil prices were going to remain at least steady or go up. Now, is it going to go higher? Than, today it was $68 and some odd cents a barrel. I don't know what it is right now, but it's around between 68 and 70. Will it go to 100 by the end of the year? I don't think so. And most of the people that I've talked to here in West Texas say, no, it probably will not. It could get as high as 85 in the fall or in the winter when we're the, uh, the, the more usage goes in the Northeast. Uh, we're not, we're not, we don't have the problem in Texas. It doesn't get that cold, although we can get awful cold. In the uh -huh. But the, the point is the industry is stable. The industry is going to be for a while, but I can assure you that we can't rely on it forever. So there will come a point in time when the price may go. It, I don't think it'll ever get back up to where it was $140 a barrel like it was several years ago. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys in my area are telling us, no, they don't expect it. They would like to see it settle in around 85. Everybody makes money, but the problem is you and I are going to pay more for gasoline if that happens. But guess what? We live in a great yes. place. We live in a great state. And I don't mind paying a little bit more for the freedoms we have and the, and the, uh, and the fact that we don't pay any income tax in Texas, which is a great thing. But we're, we're in good shape in that regard. The oil business is strong. It's stable. And I think for the next three or four years, we're going to see a, uh, a continual boom, if you will, gradual, not like it did that back uh, several years ago, but it's going to be there for a good while to come. Okay. Back off and relax. <laughs> so do you think if I were to come to you and say, hey, D, I'm, I'd like to invest in some oil because yeah. could this make me some money? Would that be right? Well, in fact, there are small oil companies. I had a man who walked in here one day and he said, I've got a hundred sunny, which I love that because anytime somebody calls me sunny, it makes me feel really, really good. Uh, he said, sunny, I've got a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to invest in oil. I want to make 10% immediately. Where can I go and get a guaranteed 10%? And I said, I have no idea. Uh, I said, first of all, there may be some small oil companies where you can go and make 10%, but you could lose 50% at the same time. Those kind of things are speculative. Anytime you do that, you may, you're speculating on what could happen to the price and what may happen in Iran, what may happen in, uh, there's just so many things that can happen right now that could cause the oil industry to do one, go one right. way or the other. So it's a highly speculative situation. And you and I both know that the more risk you've got, the better return you could possibly have. But on the other side of the coin, is there money to be made? I believe there's money to be made right now. Uh, maybe 5%, maybe as much as 10% gain over the next uh, year or two. But guess what? There's also as equal or maybe a better chance, according to all the economists I'm talking to and reading about, saying that the, the industry could drop and, the, and the, the economy could go down and the market could drop by as much as 50%. If that's the case, is okay, a 5% gain worth a 50% risk? I don't think it is. Right. I, I would have to agree with that. And what makes you the man is knowing that you can take that money and get 5% maybe in an IRA or CD or whatever, another form um, that may be a little bit more secure. Well, but coming to you and your, in your company, we're going to be able to find out what is the best for us. That's really what our goal is. Our goal is to find out where you are, what you're, you know, we've got a thing about risk tolerance. One of the, the directives in the book talks about your risk tolerance. You know, as a Texan, I call that your threshold of pain. Uh, you can only go as far as it hurts. And when it starts hurting, you've got to change direction. <laughs> so we tell people all the time, your risk tolerance is really your threshold of pain. And we talk about that. And is it worth going into something that it will be painful down the road? That is something you've got to really work with. And remembering that little formula that I gave you earlier, total return equals growth plus income. Realizing that that G could very easily turn into an L depending on the circumstances. And if it turns into an L, you could lose 40 to 50 to 60% of your basic retirement income overnight. And then where are you? You're starting over again and maybe you're 65 and then you're going to work until you just drop. And that's just the way it is. Yes, yes, and this is a big challenge. Well, I've got to tell you, I am really fascinated by your background, your experience, and the amount of knowledge you have, but also the information that you provide right here. And so I'd like you to let our viewers know how they can get a copy, how to connect with you, and also 
if they would like to get in touch with you so that they can gain better grasp in I, their financial I, endeavors. I appreciate that. You can, you can actually go to amazon.com and get the book. Uh, we were number nine with a bullet last week, as I recall, out of the, uh, the hot 100. And that's, that's fantastic for a, a guy that's never written a book. But just go to amazon.com, look in their D. Carter, it's now or never, and you can find the book there on their front page. Order the book, read the book. I would love to get some reviews and some callbacks and, and get people to sit down and, and contact me. I, I'll give you my email address. You can just call me. It's dkcart at hotmail.com. It's real simple, dkcart at hotmail.com. Send me an email. Tell me what you think about the book and let me know what you can uh, about that. You can go to our website. Now, I, I have to read this website. It's longer than I can remember, but it's D. Carter Financial, and that's just D, not D-E-E, -E, D. Carter Financial, and it's fixedincomecouncil.com. And uh, so your D. Carter Financial, fixedincomecouncil.com. You can go in there and find a lot of things there. Uh, you can go on the advisorsacademy.com. That's a group that I'm a part of. They've got my book listed there at the advisorsacademy.com. So there's a lot of places you can get it. Uh, just get it. You can find it. I think you'll have a lot of fun reading it. I really believe you will. It, it is a fun read. It was definitely something that I didn't expect when I picked up the copy because I've seen, I've read a lot of financial books and sometimes they can be very dry. But when I've got to tell you, you really connect with the reader and you give the reader something to think about that is personal to them and you connect with them. This is crucial because when you're, you, there's more value in knowing someone that has had a similar or a background much like yours and they they have done it they have been there it, it is just very very different when you get that from somebody else and you almost don't want to believe what they say or you don't want to take the risk or even just even a small portion of it so not only do I want to thank you for writing the book but I want to thank you for the amount of different advisory boards that you're on and the different memberships that you have and all of these things go back to helping others and to helping others prosper in a number of ways and so I, I really commend you and thank you for everything that you've done that's very right. sweet of you. Thank you, Rebecca. I, and I will say this, that I didn't write the book for any monetary gain. I found out, by the way, when you write a book, you don't make a lot of monetary gain anyway. <laughs> That's but, very true. But, <laughs> but what I do I would like to, the listeners to know is that uh, uh, whatever money I make, half of it will go to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I have my the daughter that you met earlier, is, we just started, uh, Mandy, who's working with me now has cystic fibrosis. She's a 37 year old walking miracle. There's a whole chapter on the, in the book about her and our relationship. And the second half of that, the other half of it will go to a scholarship that my wife and I set up at Abilene Christian University about six years ago. And we've had six students to graduate from the university now on that scholarship. So we're trying to give back to the people that gave to us and that have blessed us over the years. That's really all you can do with your life is do your best you can, give the best that you've got, Always do the best you are, be the best person you are and can be, and give back to those who have uh, needs that you perhaps can help with. And that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And without leaving the program, without sh not leaving the program, without sharing with the viewers your weekly radio show, can you tell them a little bit about what it's about and where they can find you? Sure. Uh, we have a Monday morning radio program on KWEL. Dot com. You can go on your computer and pick it up anywhere. It's kwel.com. It's, uh, it's FM 107.1 AM 1070 here in Midland. But the best way to get it is uh, around the state is on that kwel.com. We're on there every Monday morning, a little bit after 8, after the news gets through. Uh, the manager of the radio station, the owner of the station is a client of mine. And we, we just get on the air. We may talk about Elvis for 30 minutes. We never know for sure. People <laughs> call in and we try to go with the answers and the questions they've got. But we try to talk something about financial planning and advice and retirement planning. And I try to throw out two or three ideas. And by the way, we give away a book every Monday morning. So if you want to call in uh, on Monday morning, we'd be more than happy to, to make sure you get a copy of the book. Uh, we sometimes do little trivia questions about uh, Elvis and stuff of that nature, but it's a lot of fun. And I have a lot of good people. I've been doing it now for about 10 years. We just, we have a great time doing it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show today. 
This has been one of the, yeah, it's been one of the most ahead. enjoyable things I've done in a long time. You do a great job, and it's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love when I can help other people. And so I know the value in what you have shared. I, I just want to get it out to the viewers because I think it's going to make a huge difference. And the other thing is you really just, I admire everything that you're doing to help others. That to me is just, it, it really makes me feel happy and good because that's what I'm passionate about as well. So <laughs> thank you so much thank oh you're so welcome and i want to thank all of you for watching today make sure that you go out and grab a copy on amazon um anywhere that you can get it and not only get a copy for yourself but get a copy for someone that you know and especially if they're in the younger generation because like we talked about earlier you can count on Social Security, but don't count on it. And that is one of the chapters you'll definitely want to read. Without any further ado, again, I want to thank you. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. I also want to thank the Liberty Beacon for allowing us to broadcast TLB on TLBTV.com. This has been Rebecca Sounds Reveille. And like Dee's book says, it's now or never. Thank you.